Hello and welcome to a brand new spotlight on nuclear crowd fission reactors. We're going to go through the solid fuel fission reactors, we're going to go through cells, we're going to go through moderators, we're going to go through coolers. So without further ado, let's get started. So let's start by going through the basics of what you're going to need to build your nuclear craft fission reactor. So the first thing you'll obviously need is a fission controller. Um, this is going to be the sort of heart of the reactor. It's where all of the fuel cells are going to go. It's, which, it's what's going to tell you all the information about the reactor. The next thing you're going to need is a bunch of reactor casing. Um, it isn't too, too difficult to make. You can make some transparent reactor casing if you want. It's sort of like windows for the reactor. It works in exactly the same way as a normal reactor casing. Um, you're also probably going to need yourself some graphite blocks, you're definitely going to need yourself some reactor cells, and you're also definitely going to need some coolers. Now there's a bunch of different types of coolers, and we'll get into those, but basically the idea of the fission reactor is that the fuel produces a bunch of energy and heat. Uh, you can increase the amount of energy and heat by adding more cells and adding graphite, and the interaction between the cell and graphite will determine how efficient your reactor is, and then you have to get rid of that heat by using coolers to make your reactor stable. So that's the basic idea. Um, so first of all, you're going to have to want to build out your reactor structure. Now, it could be any cuboid. Um, the maximum length size by default is 24, but you can uh, increase that in the configs if you really want to. Um, I'm just going to make a small reactor to start with. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to build out a base here. Let's just say 4x4, four four, that's good enough. And then I'm going to build out the sides. Now, the important thing with nuclear craft reactors that's a bit different to extreme reactors is that you cannot have reactor casing along the edge like this. That's that's important. You cannot have reactor casings on the edge. You can have them in the corners. That won't affect the build, but um, the structure will not be read correctly if you have any casing on the edge. So just make sure it's on the faces only. So let's just build this out. As I said, it doesn't have to be a cube. It can just be any cuboids, just like extreme reactors. Now, if you have the connected textures mod installed, um, from the people who made chisel, I think, uh, then you will get connected textures for the uh, reactor casing. Um, now you can, uh, although you cannot put casing on the edges, you can put other types of block on the edges, and I'm just going to fill out, just for aesthetics, no actual um, mechanical reasons, going to just put blast blocks around the edge here. So I'm just demonstrating that you can put other blocks around the sides, um, It just, ha makes, just make sure it isn't casing. And then in the middle here, I'm going to put a fission controller. Now you can put the fission controller uh, in the middle of the structure if you really want to and as you will see um, it does read the structure perfectly fine but I am going to put it down here um, just because I want to. And there we are 4x3x4 four four fission reactor and it's read the structure. Um, now you can see here that we've got no fuel um, so the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to uh, put some fuel into your reactor. Um, now the best way I think of building a fission reactor if you know what fuel you want to burn is to actually put the, the fuel in first. And don't turn the reactor on yet, and then as you build on, uh, build inside the reactor, um, it will update these numbers here, and you can check to see when your reactor is safe to run. So the best thing to do is to build a reactor for a given fuel, not try and get a fuel that works for a reactor. That's, that's really the best way to do it. So I'm going to put some LEU-235 fuel in here. This is the simplest type of fuel. Um, it's made out of um, uranium-238 and uranium-235. These are both uh, materials that you can get right from the beginning of the game, straight from uranium ore. Um, and the reason, another reason I'm using it is because the numbers are quite kind. Its base power is 120 RF per tick and its base heat gen is 50 heat per tick. So it'll be a little bit easier because they're quite nice round numbers. It'll be a bit easier to see um, the effect of adding more cells and more graphite. Um, now every single fuel here, you can see there's about 50 fuels here. Every single one of them has a different base process time, base power and base heat gen. So you will need different reactor designs for each type of fuel. Now if you want to go all the way up the fuel tree, all the way up to Californium and start getting RTGs, you do not have to go through every single fuel, I assure you. But you will have to go through a couple, at least four or five. Um, and you will have to probably build a different style of reactor for each one. Um, you are not penalised for reactors overcooling or, in fact, overheating. The only p penalty, obviously, for overheating is that you have a meltdown. But there is a way to stop meltdowns, and we'll get into that. Um, but anyway, there is our reactor with some fuel in it. Now it's time to start actually putting some stuff inside of it. Okay, so one last thing I will say before I actually start putting stuff inside the reactor is that I've put myself a reactor door here inside the structure so I can walk in and out easily of the reactor. Um, as you can see, you can actually just put other blocks inside of the uh, fission structure. It won't affect the design at all. So be you know you can put decoration, you can put torches and all sorts of stuff inside the reactor if it gets dark. Um, but I'm putting this door here because it means I can get inside and outside the reactor a little bit easier. And um, it also won't I won't have to break the structure every single time I want to get in there. 
Um, so this is quite a nice way of making, uh, you know, getting inside the reactor a little bit smoother. There is also a trap door. Um, so if we look here, you can see that there is a trap door and again, does exactly the same thing as a door. You can get inside and outside the reactor um, a little bit more quickly. But anyway, let's get started with adding cells to the reactor. This is the place to start. Um, so reactor cells are pretty much the most important part of the reactor because that's where the fuel is housed and it will generate energy. So let's just put one cell in there to start with. It doesn't matter really where you put the cell, um, at least when it's on its own. So if we put that in there and we come back outside, we can see that we've now got one cell inside the reactor. Oh, I actually broke the controller, so I need to put another fuel in there. So you can see now that we've got 120 RF per tick and 50 heat per tick generated by the fission reactor. Now it isn't actually on yet, you need a lever uh, to turn on the fission controller and when you turn this on the reactor will start running and actually making a slight Geiger ticking noise um, to let you know that it's on. Um, so you can see here that we are generating 120 RF per tick but we're also generating a bit of heat as well. Um, now for the most of this uh, tutorial I am going to just leave the reactor off and that's because we can see easily here what's important is looking at the stats of the reactor and they're all here we don't actually have to turn the reactor on to see that. Um, but the important thing is that basically one cell inside the reactor on its own generates the base heat and the base power of the fuel, as you can see here. If we put two cells in, then we see that the power and the heat doubles. So we've now got 240 and 100. And again, if we had three, then we get 360 and 150 heat per tick. Now you may have noticed there that I was being careful not to um, place the cells adjacent to each other. That's because if cells are adjacent to each other, then they will actually generate ad additional heat and additional power. So if we place two next to each other here, we'll see that we now get 480 RF per tick, which is four times the base, and 300 heat per tick, which is six times the base. So what's basically happening is that each of the cells are generating twice of the amount of power and three times the amount of heat. Now if you go into these bars for energy and heat level, we'll see that the efficiency has gone up to 200%, basically telling us that on average each cell is generating twice as much energy, but we'll also see that the heat multiplier has gone up to 300%, which means that each cell is on average generating three times as much power. Um, now just to demonstrate how the averaging works, I now have these two cells here. If I was to put two more cells that aren't touching each other inside the reactor and come back outside, we'd see that we just generate um, so it's 480, 480, it's gone up to 720, so that's an additional uh, 240, which is just two times the base, and an additional 100 heat per tick, which is just two times the base again. And we'll see that the efficiency has now gone to 150%, and that's because two of the cells are 100% efficiency and two of them are 200. And the same thing here, two of the um, cells are generating three times the amount of heat, and two of them are generating the normal amount of heat. So you will have to think about this. If you want to make more efficient designs, um, they will generate a lot more heat. And so you're going to have to think more carefully about how you cool them. Um, if you have a cell that is adjacent to two other reactor cells, so all of them here are adjacent to two other reactor cells, then you can see that we now have an efficiency of 300%, meaning each of the cells are generating three times the amount of power but the heat multiplier has now gone up to 600%. So as you increase the number of adjacent cells for each other, other cell, then the efficiency will go up linearly, but the heat multiplier will go up quadratically. So it's a bit like the IC2 system for their uranium cells. Um, so if you want to make more efficient reactors, then you're going to have to deal with a lot more heat. So that's the basic idea of um, cells being next to each other. So the next thing to talk about is moderators. Uh, now there are two moderators in the game, they do exactly the same thing. Um, there used to be only graphite, but now you can use beryllium as a moderator. And effectively what moderators do is they increase the efficiency of a reactor um, without having to add additional cells. So what I'm going to do here is just put uh, one cell inside the reactor and put a single graphite block next to it. As I said, a beryllium block would do exactly the same thing. Um, but if I come outside here, you'll see now that instead of the efficiency uh, being 100%, it's now 116%, but the heat multiplier has gone up to 133%. Now, by default, each graphite block uh, next to a single cell that's on its own, not touching any other cells, uh, will generate an a, a sixth extra power. So that's why the efficiency has gone up by a sixth. And the heat multiplier has gone up by a third. So a single graphite block increases the heat multiplier by 33% and the efficiency by 116%. Now, if I was to put a, another cell in here that's not next to a, a graphite block, then we'll 
see again that it will average out. And so the heat, mul the heat multiplier is 116% uh, because one of them is 133, one of them is 100. And here again, the efficiency is halved between 100 and 116. So graphite blocks do no longer affect, they used to in earlier versions, they no longer affect the reactor as a whole. They only affect cells that they're adjacent to. Now, you can put as many cells as you want next to a single graphite block. So, for example, here, um, I'm going to just put uh, three uh, reactor cells next to this single graphite block. If we come back outside, we'll see that the efficiency is still 116 and the heat multiplier is still 133. Now, if we put two graphite blocks next to a single cell, we'll see that the efficiency has gone up to 133%. That's because 16% um, is added by, or six, well, one-sixth is added by each of the graphite blocks, and um, those two added together make a third. And here the heat multiplier has gone up by two-thirds. So basically two graphite blocks has just doubled um, the amount of extra heat and efficiency added. And again, we can add three, and if we come outside, we'll see that the efficiency has gone up to 150%, and the heat multiplier has gone up to 200 and as you can see, you can start building out these structures where you have systems of graphite and uh, reactor cells. And the number of graphite blocks that touch a single reactor cell will increase the power and heat generated by that single reactor cell. And the number of extra reactor cells that touch a graphite block will increase the usefulness of that graphite block, if you know what I mean. So that's sort of the way to think about how to use graphite. Now, another thing that graphite can do, or beryllium as well, moderators in general, it can link reactor cells together. So normally these reactor cells would not be touching and their efficiency would be 100%. But if I put a graphite block in the middle of the two of them and come back outside, then you can see here the efficiency is now 233%. Now the reason for that is because both of the reactor cells are now considered touching each other. And so their efficiency, raw efficiency, has gone up to 200%. But the graphite is then touching both of those cells and so is adding an additional one-sixth of the efficiency onto the base and one-sixth of 200% is 233%. And so each of those cells now have an efficiency of 233%. However, additionally, each of those cells has a heat multiplier of 300%, and so the graphite is adding an extra third, and so the heat multiplier has now gone up to 366%. Now, what is actually very important is that you can actually have up to four, by default, you can change this in the configs, so you can have up to four moderator blocks between your reactor cells, and that will actually still increase their efficiency. But do keep in mind, that graphite blocks or brilliant blocks that are not actually touching a reactor cell will not generate extra power, all right? Only, extra power is only generated by moderator blocks that are actually adjacent to reactor cells. So this one here and these two here will not generate additional power, but they will be joining these cells together. So do think about that. Do think about the math a little bit. Um, is it worth having these cells joining or should you have some extra cells somewhere um, that increases the efficiency that way. So inside this reactor here, for example, I have two beryllium blocks between the cells. And again, we have the efficiency of 233 and the heat multiplier of 366. And again, that's because we have two reactor cells at a raw efficiency of 200%. And then each of these beryllium blocks is increasing it by one third and one sixth for heat and power respectively. So that is pretty much all there is to say about moderator blocks. All right, so now it's time to move on to the most complicated, but also, of course, the most important part of nuclear reactors, which is, using Quark's amazing hotbar changer, cooling. So there are 15 passive coolers in the game by default. There is also active cooling, and we'll get to that at the end. Uh, but basically, passive cooling is the main way you're going to be wanting to cool down your fission reactor. So there are a load of different coolers, water, redstone, quartz, gold, uh, lapis, glowstone, liquid helium, and loads of others um, which I won't go through. But basically, uh, there are loads of different types. And they all have different recipes, of course. Uh, they're all pretty simple recipes. They're all based on the empty cooler, and then you put the different materials in. Um, of course, the Enderium and Cryothium uh, will only be available if you have a uh, thermal foundation installed. Um, but there are still loads of others that you can use. Now, basically, uh, the important thing to know about coolers is that they all have different cooling rates, as you can see here. They've all got different cooling rates. Usually, the more expensive ones have better cooling rates. Um, and also they have different rules. So for example, the water cooler must touch at least one reactor cell or an active moderator block. Active in all of these tooltips basically just means that it itself must be in a valid position. So an active moderator block is a moderator block, a graphite block or a brilliant block that is adjacent to a reactor cell itself. Um, so we have a reactor cell in there with a water cooler. Now you remember that the T uh, LEU uh, 30 235 fuel generates 
50 heat per tick uh, by itself, um, but the water cooler is going to generate is going to cool at a rate of 60 heat per tick. So you can see here now that we've got minus 10 heat per tick inside the fission reactor, and that means the reactor is now safe to run and it doesn't generate any heat when it's running. So you can see here that the heat level is just zero. It doesn't it doesn't move, and that means I can just run this reactor indefinitely and it will not melt down. So that's the sort of nice thing about cooling is that you can now leave your reactor running. And that's sort of the important thing is that if you want to actually make efficient reactors that actually generate an average um, good RF per tick, then you're going to have to want to cool your reactors, at least reasonably. Um, the least th last thing you want to do is not put any cooling in there at all. Um, so that's the water cooler. And we'll just do some other examples. So the redstone cooler um, needs to touch at least one reactor cell. So this would do a similar thing. Um, if we just put that there, you'll see that the heat level is down to 40, so minus 90. Um, just to show you that the coolers do not work if you put them in an invalid position. You can see that redstone coolers do nothing because it's in the wrong place. Um, so you must make sure that the coolers are in the right place or they will literally do nothing. Um, the next thing is the uh, quartz cooler, which um, must touch at least one graphite block. Um, so it needs to do something like this. So it needs to just touch a graphite block like that. And the graphite block itself must be active. So um, you can see here that if we come outside that the cooling is being done. But if we were to get rid of this cell, or put it over here, say, let's put the let's put the reactor cell over here, so that it's not touching the graphite. You can see now this quartz cooler is still touching graphite, but this graphite is not active because it's not next to a reactor cell, and so you can see the cooling is not happening. The heat level is just 100 heat per tick, and that's because the graphite is uh, generating an extra penalty amount of heat because it's not even active, um, and the penalty that you get from a graphite block not being next to a cell is equal to the base heat generation of the cell itself. And so you can see that the amount of heat we're generating is double the base. And you can see the, the quartz cooler, which is meant to be cooling at 70 heat per tick, is not doing anything either because the uh, it's not actually in a valid position. So that's the quartz cooler. Uh, the next cooler is the gold cooler. That must touch at least one active water cooler. So the water cooler itself must be, must be active and an active redstone cooler. The glowstone cooler must touch at least two active moderator blocks, so it must have something like this. So we've got, say we've got two uh, cells like that, and then we have some beryllium, and the beryllium must be active, and then the glowstone cooler can go in there, say. So that would mean an active glowstone cooler. Again, that wouldn't work, something like that, where the, the, uh, the graphite isn't active. Next thing is lapis coolers. This must touch a reactor cell and a reactor casing, so it must be uh, next to a reactor casing, at least one of them, and also next to a cell. It doesn't matter where the cell is, as long as it's touching. Uh, the diamond cooler must be next to at least two active water coolers and one active quartz cooler. That's actually quite a difficult one, but does work very well in the particular designs. The liquid helium cooler, this is an interesting one, must touch exactly one active redstone cooler. So if it's touching two, it will not work. It has to touch exactly. So do read carefully what it says in the tooltip, and at least one reactor casing. Enderium. Enderium is a bit of a weird one um, because it doesn't actually require any cells to be in the reactor at all. It doesn't need to be near any cells or moderators. The Enderium cooler just must be touching at least three reactor casings at one vertex. So something like this. If you have made a sort of pancake reactor which is one block thick, then the Enderium coolers will not work um, because it will be touching four reactor casings. It must touch exactly three. So it works really well in the corners. So Enderium is quite expensive, but it works really well in the corners of, of reactors. It does a lot of cooling. Cryothium must touch at least two reactor cells. Iron coolers must be next to at least an active gold cooler, which of course itself must be next to a water and redstone that's working. The emerald must touch at least one active moderator block and one reactor cell. The copper must touch at least one active glowstone cooler. And the tin cooler must be next to at least, uh, well, at least two active lapis coolers along the same axis. So what I mean by that is that the lapis cooler um, the two lapis coolers must be along the same line like this. It won't, the tin cooler will not work if the lapis coolers um, are sort of at an angle like this. It must be in a straight line. So that's what the same axis means. And then the tin cooler will work. As long as the um, lapis coolers themselves, of course, are next to reactor cells. And then finally, the magnesium cooler, which must touch a reactor casing and an active moderator block. So those are all the different rules for the coolers. Um, your job as the nuclear engineer is to work out how best to design your reactor, put the cells and the moderators and the coolers in to make the most efficient reactor you can. Um, so that is the basic idea. So there we go, that's pretty much um, cooling, or passive cooling at least. It's just a, basically a puzzle and you at the end of the day are going to have to uh, work it out. So it can be difficult, especially for the really hot 
uh, fuels, uh, but it is possible, I assure you. Um, so if you like that sort of thing, then Nuclear Craft is a mod for you. If not, then you might have a bit of a tough time. But ultimately, that's just the way the mod's designed. So next, uh, we're going to have a look at the ways to interact with the fission controller without having to just access the GUI down here itself. So next, we have automation of the reactor. So there are a couple of ways to automate the reactor. Um, first of all, you can literally just use item conduits on the controller. So if I was to put a chest down here um, and set up these conduits, I'm not actually uh, used to uh, Enderio conduits. They've only just been added back in, but I think I've got the hang of it. It's pretty, pretty well designed. Um, and I can obviously just pump in um, cell, uh, fuels this way. Um, so it just works like any other machine from Nuclear Craft. You can just pump them straight in. Um, so that's one way to do it, um, but you'll find eventually that you're running out of space for your fission controller. Um, one option is machine interfaces, which is the general nuclear craft way of extending the sides of a machine. But the specific way to do it for um, reactors that you can use is fission ports. Now fission ports have a sidedness. You can see here that it has this ring around the side, um, which is sort of the front of the port. And the port must go on the side, it cannot go on the top. So if you put a fission port on the side here, um, it's pretty easy to install just like that. First of all, you can access the GUI of the fission reactor, um, but it can also be used uh, to pump in um, fuels and pump out depleted fuels. So I'm going to just put a chest here. Uh, let's first of all... Oh, I don't know what I've done there. I put an energy, energy conduit down somehow. Um, let's first of all set these conduits up. And you can see here, pretty simple, that the LEU-235 fuel is going into the reactor. And similarly, you can pull out depleted fuels. So once the reactor has depleted, you can pull them out of the port into a chest and reprocess them. Um, so that is pretty much how it works. Pretty simple. Um, another thing that fission ports can do is you can use them to pull out energy. So you can attach energy conduits and uh, connect them to an energy cell or whatever. So you can see here that the energy that we generated when generating that little bit of power has come out of the fission port and gone on to the, into this energy cell. So fission ports are basically just an extension of the fission controller. You can use it to pull out items and put it put in items and also pull out energy. So that's basically what fission ports are for. Um, you can use multiple fission ports. You can put them all around the reactor, wherever the hell you want. You can put them here, here, whatever, um, and the structure will still stay intact. Um, if you have a bunch of fission ports that are pulling out energy, so say if I have a load of fission ports here that are pulling out energy, then each one of them will share the amount of energy generated by the fission reactor. So here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven fission ports. So each one of them will receive one seventh of the amount of energy generated. So they will share um, energy output of the reactor. So there you go, that's fission ports, pretty simple, just extends the controller. Um, next thing is getting active cooling working. So active cooling is a much more efficient way of cooling your reactor. However, it is very expensive in some cases. Now, you can use any molten form of any of these uh, coolers, if you know what I mean. So basically, you can use water, um, destabilized redstone, molten quartz, molten gold, molten glowstone, all of the molten versions or the liquid versions, basically, of the uh, cooler passive cooler types. And they have different cooling amounts. You can see how much they cool um, in the configs. But you are going to need yourself some active fluid coolers, pretty simple to make, and these are what are actually going to do the cooling. So let's just set up a little uh, reactor here. Um, so let's get a cell and put down, uh, let's get rid of this stuff, we don't need this anymore. So let's put a cell down inside of the reactor. And you can see here that we're generating again 50 heat per tick. Now I'm only going to be using water coolers, um, but as I said before, you can use any. But the important thing to know is there's two things important to know about active fluid coolers. First of all, um, the ruling, the rules for the active fluid cooler, depending on what fluid they have in them, is exactly the same as their passive counterpart. So for example, if I'm going to use active water cooling, the active cooler must touch uh, a reactor cell and an active moderator block. If I was to use gelid cryothium, I must touch at least two reactor cells, etc, etc. And the other important thing about active fluid cooling to know is that they themselves cannot support other coolers. So you cannot, for example, um, use an active water cooler to support a gold cooler. So the gold cooler will not accept the active fluid water cooling as a requirement for it itself. You must use passive coolers to, um, as the requirements for other coolers. So that's sort of a nerf active fluid coolers to balance out the fact that they're really powerful, is that they cannot be used to support other coolers. 
but they still must um, obey the rules. So I'm going to put an active fluid cooler down here. I'm going to put it in the middle of the reactor. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put a buffer into the side of the reactor structure. This is different to a fission port. Um, it is difficult to see on the inside, but on the outside um, it should be um, obvious enough the ring isn't there. So this is a buffer, and the buffer basically acts as a way to get fluid and items, in fact, and energy or whatever. Buff buffers in general can hold energy items and fluid, but it's important for the reactor to hold fluid. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to just connect an infinite water source to this buffer, and water will flow uh, into the buffer from the infinite water source. So water is now in that buffer, and I will pump out fluid from the buffer into the active cooler. So buffers will accept energy, uh, so, sorry, accept fluid, but you need to um, pull it out uh, on the other side. So I'm going to extract, always active, and you can see that water is now going into the active cooler. If I now come outside, you can see that I'm now doing some cooling, and I'm doing a cooling of 50 heat per tick. Now that at the moment is a bit of a bug that will be increased um, because obviously water coolers um, themselves gener uh, cool at a rate of 60 heat per tick, so it's silly that this is worse. Um, but I assure you that I will fix that in the next update. Um, water coolers will be a lot more effective. Active water cooling will be a lot more effective. Um, if you use the active cooling from the more expensive materials like molten redstone, in fact any of these other ones are very expensive if you think about it, trying to continuously generate molten versions of gold and emeralds and quartz is quite expensive. Um, those types of coolers are very, very, very powerful. Um, so let's do an example of that. Um, so let's set up, the easiest one to set up of course is the resonant ender in the top corner here. So uh, let's set up that. Uh, now buffers will automatically push to active coolers if they're directly adjacent to the buffer. Um, and additionally, um, active coolers will also share fluid. Um, so for example, you see here that we've got this water going to this active cooler. Um, now this active cooler of course won't do anything because it's not next to a reactor cell. But if we come out here, we'll see that the cooling rate is minus 50. So two of the coolers, active coolers are working. And that's because these two are sharing the uh, water. Um, so do keep that in mind um, for when you're placing down your active coolers. So I'm going to place down an active cooler here, and I'm going to have to get some resonant ender to pump in. So let's just do that quickly. Let's get ourselves a portable tank from thermal expansion. Put it on top uh, and get a crescent hammer to turn it into output mode, and then get some resonant ender to fill that up. So if we come in here, well, we, I think I can actually press L maybe, or K is it? I know I could press something, maybe not. I, I don't really know how the one probe works. Um, so if I come in here, uh, you'll see that the amount of cooling that this resonant ender does, it's absolutely ginormous. So this is what I mean. The really expensive um, f uh, active fluids are incredibly powerful. And as I said before, water coolers, uh, active water cooling will be made better. So use active cooling if you have a lot of materials and you are not afraid of... Um, using up things like resonant ender, burning through ender pearls. Um, the active cooler will use up uh, the liquid very, very slowly, however, so it's not that bad. Um, it uses up uh, fuel at a rate of, I think, um, one millibucket every second, or five millibuckets every second, I think. Um, I need to look that up. Uh, it will show it on the bottom of the screen. I think I got that uh, number a bit wrong. It will show it at the bottom of the screen. That's how much uh, liquid it uses, but it is not a lot, so you should be able to deal with that. Uh, it should be fine. Um, and I think that's basically um, the basics of active cooling. Again, it's up to you. You've got to have to come up with the designs, but it's very, very powerful, but it is limited in that it can't support other coolers. So you will have to use a mix of passive and active cooling. Um, and I think that is pretty much everything to do with the reactor, apart from the last thing, which is using a comparator to um, measure the heat. Um, now, this is the last thing you can do. If you have a design which is heat positive, so let's get rid of this um, enderium quickly. So let's get rid of all this cooling and let's just put a load of cells in here and turn the reactor on. So let's get a lever. And you can see here that our reactor is now going to generate a lot of heat. Now, when this generates, starts generating a lot of heat, you'll see the heat level start to rise, but the comparator will also read the heat level. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to get myself, um, I'm going to put a few coolers in there just to show how this would work in practice. So let's just put a bunch of um, water coolers in there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get myself some redstone. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to loop the redstone back round again into the reactor. 
Um, now, I need to be a bit careful that the uh, lever isn't going to block this. And what we're going to have to do here is we're going to have to use a not gate because obviously the fission reactor is, uh, the comparator is doing it the wrong way around. So let's get ourselves a, let's just use a reactor casing, why not? And we'll put a redstone torch down. And what will happen is that the reactor will run. And then as the reactor runs, the heat level will increase. The redstone comparator will start putting out a signal. And the higher the heat level, the stronger the signal is. So you can see we're now going up to heat level power 4. And as soon as the power level of the redstone is high enough, it will trigger this redstone torch, turning off the reactor. So we don't even leave lever at all, actually. Um, so this is a way of making your reactor safe if your um, reactor is heat positive. You can use this little loop of redstone and a comparator and, an off and a, 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 not, a not gate. And you can turn the reactor off this way. Obviously it looks a little ugly, um, but you can hide this underground if you want with some neater redstone than I've, this crude setup I've got here. Um, but if you are struggling, really struggling to um, lower the heat below um, zero, uh, then you can use this and the reactor will turn on and off as the heat level um, goes up. And I think, other than that, I have covered the basics of fission reactors. I don't think there's much more to say about basically how they work. Um, I've gone through how the cells work, how the graphite works, how the coolers work, how active cooling works, how the ports and buffers work, and how to set up a comparator loop if you want to. So that is pretty much everything, as I said. And in the next video, I will show you how fusion reactors work, the basis of fusion reactors. And then I will make another video about how to go about actually building good reactor designs, at least basic for the basic fuels like LEU-235. Because I haven't really shown you exactly how to actually make a good design. I've just basically showed you how the cells and the coolers work. Um, this design, of course, is pretty terrible. It doesn't actually generate that much and also generates heat. Um, so I want to show you how you go about doing that. Um, so thank you all very much for watching. If you have any questions, go into the comments and uh, ask them me. Uh, ask them to me, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.